Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Foster's Features Presents All of Them Angels. My guest today played nurse Shirley Brent on the classic BBC series Angels for the first four seasons, and she's here today to give us the exclusive of her time on the show. Please join me in welcoming the one, the only, multi-talented, the brilliant Miss Claire Clifford. Hey, Claire, how you doing? I'm good, Foster. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> I love welcome. it. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, all right. So uh, just to get started on it, um, can you give me a brief rundown of your career before Angels? Because if I'm not mistaken, Angels was your first big major role and uh, you'd never really done any, th any uh, film or television before that, right? No, absolutely. None at all. Um, I was in the Rocky Horror Show at the time, but I'd only left drama school I left drama school in 73, went to did some theater up in Scotland. There's a, a thing called the Pitlochry Festival Theater where lots of people have started out uh, eight months up in the Scottish Highlands. It, it, wonderful, wonderful place to, to work, um, to get the equity card. Um, then I came back via a repertory company in Cheltenham. And in December, I'd, look, I'd looked it up. November 74 was the first time I was the first audition for, first meeting for Angels. Mm -hmm. And then I started in the Rocky Horror Show at the end of that, of December. But I hadn't done any film or television at all. Oh, wow. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, your mother was English actress Nancy Gower, yes. who coincidentally would later on play your mother on the last episode of the first se yeah. season. So she was very keen that I, um, that I went up for this. I didn't, I didn't have an agent. The only way I heard about Angels was that a friend uh, of mine was a script, was working in the script department at the BBC. And he said, There's, they're doing this huge thing with six young nurses, you must apply. So I had no, I had no agent. Uh, so I just sent in my, what was then a very small resume. And um, as I say, the first interview was in November and then a recall at the end of December. So I suppose I must've gone up in January again. Um, and then I, I heard that I'd got it the day before my birthday in February, I got the call. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A day to remember. <laughs> Must have been a good birthday present, too. Fantastic birthday present. Yes, yes. And um, you've explained the auditioning process already, but um, when you were auditioning, were you always up for the part of Shirley or did you audition for other parts as well? No, I mean, we didn't know. Nobody knew. You were just seen. Um, I don't think I was given anything else to read. In fact, I'm not sure we... I'm not sure there were any scripts by then. I can't remember, but... Uh, we did, none of us knew, I don't think, you know, there it wasn't like, we, there wasn't a, it hadn't gone out that there were specific parts to be filled. They were looking for a group of however many they'd decided on who could illustrate different facets, I guess, of, of nurses. After you got the part of Shirley, um, after um, all the other actors too got their parts, my research tells me that you guys had to, um, in order to make your performances as authentic as possible for portraying nurses, you had to have some sort of um, medical training and, uh, you know, go to hospitals and work as nurses, depending upon how far along in the education process your character was, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I, I skived off that because I was, I was doing the Rocky Horror Show uh, which was twice a night, twice nightly down the King's Road in the King's Road Theatre playing magenta or, or when I wasn't backup singer, I was playing magenta. Um, and uh, so there was no way that I was going to be able to have two weeks off to go and do what the others did. So I think I said, well, look, it's all right. I, I used to work for a vet when I was a child. I used to, in my holidays, I used to, because I wanted to be a vet. So it'll be, so I don't think, I don't think I did. I might have gone round the ward. I might have done a day trip, but I didn't do what some of the others did. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, because um, I know that uh, Julie, um, who played uh, Joe, 
Joe Longhurst. Her character was a second year nurse. And I know she told me she had to go to a uh, hospital and work as an auxiliary nurse. Um, Erin Garrity told me um, her character, um, Maureen, her, she was a first year nurse, so she didn't have to go do as much. You know, she did more observing, but still right. had to learn how to make those beds. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, hospital corners. I think I had a lesson in those in bed in bed making. Yep, I think uh, here in America, I think there another term for it is military corners or military oh, yeah. style. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. And as you were going along, uh, reading the script and like you know finding your way about um, the character Shirley, did you find that there were any parallels between the two of you, or did you feel like you were like her at all? Well. I can only, you know, if you're casting, having now been on the other side of, of the casting process, you know, in casting people when I've been directing, um, there, of course, you're looking for some, something in the character that, um, you know, that you can, rec that, rec that, that, that sparks recognition for, for the, you know, in the character. So I'm sure they were. I mean, yes, I'm quite shy, quite awkward, uh, when I was young, awkward in social situations. So I think there probably were. I mean, by the time we'd, Ron Craddock, who was our wonderful initial producer, by the time he'd met me a few times, he probably, he probably sussed that there were, that there were similarities. I mean, I think it was so, it was wonderfully cast in that all of, all of us were so different. So different. I, it's been really interesting for doing for this, for you, for watching again I was watching today doing my homework and a you know oh my god we were so young <laughs> I can't believe it's 45 years ago um, but also everyone was so so different and so nuanced um, I really enjoyed it I had to tear myself away and take the dog out for a walk I, I mean <laughs> I haven't watched it for you know I've watched well I watched a couple with my mum a few years ago but um Fascinating. I want to see series three. Yes, um, for those who are listening right now or um, when I edit this later, I actually have started circulating a petition for the BBC to release series three on DVD because um, that is actually, I think, the last series that has the original cast from the yeah. first series and it's not been released on DVD yet. The first two seasons have, but uh, not series three. And uh, I'll leave a link in the description of the video for everyone to go and uh, sign the petition if they can. Good, and also I thought you could, um, you could try and get us put on BritBox. You know, there's this new streaming service in the UK now, which is a com uh, combined thing between BBC and ITV. And it's called BritBox, of course. Um, and it's showing all sorts of stuff from the 70s and the sitcoms and way, way back. So that would be an ideal platform for angels, I think, for the whole right. lot again. So if you, could, if you could find out about that and find out who you write to, because you're obviously very persuasive. So <laughs> I shall leave it in your tender care. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hope. And um, it seems that um, just going through your background, it seems that by trade, and craft, you were a theater person or a theater artist or theater yep. actor, I should say. Did you oh. find that transition from like going from theater to, you know, performing on film and like, you know, not having to have your performance set in stone mm -hmm. and having to maybe change it up a bit and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. go through some trials and errors and listening to a director go micromanaging scene by scene. Did you have a little bit of, did you, was that transition difficult for you at all? Yeah, very good question. Um, I had no, no, it was so different then. The business was so different. Theater was legit. Theater was what you did. Uh, in the three years at Central School of Speech and Drama, there was no film technique training at all. And I, I've, I've taught a lot of it since in, in various drama schools, but there was absolutely none then. And no, theatre was where, where you went and, and TV was okay, but it wasn't really the, the, the real thing. And I was doing, I was in the Rocky Horror Show in its uh, second year down the King's Road. So it was quite new still. And I mean, that was, it was crazy and it was wonderful and it was packed and it was mad. And, and I, I remember sitting in the dressing room, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. And the girls were going, 
but you've got a television series. I thought, no, but this is, this is where it's at. And I don't think I've ever quite lost that. But that being said, I'd get, I do get very, I get a great deal of stage fright in the theater, which I don't get uh, with, with filming. So um, I, I love, I enjoy filming and I love the technique of filming and I love the, 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 the minutiae of filming. And, but it was, um, and luckily, um, I suppose the others had all done qu quite a bit, but I hope it. I don't think it showed too much in the in the from the you know from the from the thing. I, I felt I felt quite at home um, on a set on a TV set. Yeah. And one of my personal one of my personal favorite episodes that you were in was episode four of series two called Legacies and you had such you know great dialogue and uh, scenes with a uh, English actress Mary Maud and who was playing a uh, drug addict and your character um, Shirley was trying to nurse her and take care of her and then all of a sudden these revelations come out about you know Shirley's past and you know the similarities that uh, Mary Maud's character feels between her and Shirley and these verbal exchanges go through and it was just mm -hmm. executed so well. And uh, it seemed like it would take a lot out of you as an actor, you know, just, you know, people don't understand, I think, what it's like filming such dramatic sequences, like, you know, fights and things like that. I mean, what was it like doing that episode? Do you remember? Well, Mary was wonderful to, to do it with. Um, you know, she's a very, very good, very good actress. Um, and so, I don't know, it gets better. The thing is, we, 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 when we did Angels, we had an incredibly luxurious um, schedule compared to today when you get no rehearsal at all. You just appear and you have to do it. And then, you, you know, we had two weeks, nearly two weeks rehearsal. So you rehearsed it like you would a play. Um, so you really have time to grow. Um, and I don't know, I don't remember that being any more in a way it's not draining it doesn't take it out of you in a way in a way it feeds you in a way working as intensely as that you don't like me and I know why we're the same Shirley Temple only you're the other side of the coin I recognized you the moment I set eyes on you you bury yourself in work All because it's work because it stops you noticing you work until you drop, so you don't have time to think and you're too tired to care. That's not true. Yes, it is. I know it is, you know it is. It's your addiction. My parents love me. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Or is it just safe? You look scared. No. Liar. Kids who run away. Sometimes it's the first positive thing they've ever done. Poison's there at home and they're running for their lives. Just you think. You hear about the ones who go wrong. Well, the media loves them. But never about the others who make out. You never will. Will what? Run away, love. You'd have done it by now otherwise. You've run. And you haven't made out. On and on about your parents. If you were free, you wouldn't need drugs, and you wouldn't talk like this. You'd true. have forgotten. Yes, it is. You're here because you haven't the guts to start again without them. And you want everybody else in exactly the same boat. You're a coward. Shut up! Shut up. Do you enjoy playing the martyr? Well, you just take, and that's worse. And you'll go on taking and using and scheming until someone has the guts to stop you. No one ever will. You arrogant bitch! And why not? Because you've nothing to be arrogant about. You go on as if we've all failed you. Haven't you? Does it never occur to you that it's you that's failed us? You can't go on blackmailing the whole world because no one cares enough about you for that. And the way you are, no one ever will. Shirley. What? Remember what I told you about being a nurse? Oh, no. No, you're the nurse. She's a human being. Now listen. No, you listen to me for a change. She's lost her temper with me. 
puts us on some sort of equal footing. Not much, but it's something. Because I'm fed up with well-meaning kindness and endless patience. Is another word for patronage. What is it you're told? Don't get involved. Not that. For her, I might try. Which happened in, in several of the episodes. I, you know, Shirley would have um, two handers with um, when she went into a, a psychiatric ward. Uh, she had a we had a, had a couple of episodes with Alan Lake, who was married to Diana Dawes, um, and I mean, and that was in, that was intense. Look, I'm nearer to these people than you'll ever be. I know how to handle them. She would have told me about Dorothy's that plan if I'd been given time. You don't give anybody any time, do you? Tell me to get out like I'm some sort of kid. Tony, I didn't. Sure, I'm all right. No, I've been in institutions all my life. First the orphanage, more than one orphanage. I've had a bed and a locker all my life. So what do you want? A medal? No, 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 but where have you been, eh? I mean, what have you seen? Well, you shut up before I make you shut up. Why don't you ask me in group tomorrow? I might take you up on that. I could. I can only say it doesn't take it out of you. It um, feeds you, gives but, you momentum. Yeah, I mean, when you've done it for the maybe, if you have to do it over and over and over again, but um, yeah, you because you discover you know, the the more you do something intense like that, the, the more you discover what you can, what's going to happen when you let go and all that. So now it's where the fun starts, man. It's where the fun starts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here for this one, but what was your favorite episode or moment from the show that you were involved in? Can you recall? Do you have one? I well, I have, I have several. One of the one of the most wonderful aspects of of a, of being an angel, of doing angels, were the people who you worked with, the actresses who came in to to work to work with you. Um, you know, people of of huge stature. Um, you know, Faith Brook, Sylvia Coleridge, Irene Handel, um, just to name three. And another wonderful woman was Jessie Matthews. You know, she was a, tele a film star and she, she was famous for doing, for dancing and for doing a song called Over My Shoulder Goes One, Over My Shoulder Goes One Leg, Over My Shoulder Goes Two. And she came in to do to one of the geriatric episodes so that was, must have been series three um in birmingham and she just had her second hip replacement and she would say she said come on girls come on over my shoulder goes one leg and she was she could still do her high kicks with her hip replacement so that was uh, you know obviously being able, i've never forgotten that um there was an episode saturday night in the first series, that I did watch that again today. <gasps> that brought it all back because that's um, that was really Shirley at her, you know, most gawky, socially awkward, unhappy, and um, I, I remember, I, just, I so remember that line. Do you like a crisp? <laughs> hey, like a crisp? Have a crisp. Um, which I, you know, I did do with a straight face, but yeah, that that I re that episode was very early on, and I do I resonated with that because th that really wasn't very far from from myself in my teens. You know, that sort of social wallflower awkwardness. I always felt too fat. I always felt you know this, that, and the other. I mean, the things that every teenager goes through, but and that's what you draw on for you know for 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 situations like that but oh it, i was i was it was excruciating to even watch it again just to, just to the, today i thought oh god poor girl poor girl and then that awful man who gives her a lift to to work in uh, interim when she's waiting for her exam results and puts his hand on it and oh and I, one thing that really i noticed was the god we've changed the sexism in it just yeah. just run of the mill ordinary every i mean the episodes are written by women there was nobody trying to you know score points or prove anything but my goodness i thought we have got a bit better 
some of you know some of just the um subliminal sexism yes you know the bloke pursuing joe in saturday night at the party and things yeah and particularly i think um that uh guy who played the photographer i don't remember his name but uh he referred to your character as being matron material which i was like oh my god man like yeah. That's what people would say back then. Like you could never get away with saying something like that today. Excuse me, there's someone I know. All right, little load of laughs she is. She's all right, really. Ideal matron material, I'd say. Uh-uh, matron's on the prowl again. Hey, like a crisp. <laughs> Made me think, why did I ever leave the series? I could have stayed in for years. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you and you looked gorgeous in that episode. You know, that was the first time I think that we had seen Shirley out of character in terms of like at work in her maybe comfort zone of her profession. And, yeah. you know, we see her out of uniform and strip that nurse veneer away. And we see her dressed, albeit dolled up, but we see yeah. more of her who yeah. she is outside of that. Yeah, and very and the very middle class, you know, all that the, the 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 contrast between her, the way she does herself up for the party, and everyone else who's just coming to have a good time, and she's you know she's overdressed. <laughs> um, and I want you know, I I always argued a bit about the amount of makeup we had. There were there are several episodes she's got too much makeup, and the hair's too, you know, the hair's done too much. If I was doing it again now, I think I'd be much more realistic, you know, real put a put a brush through those over those curls that had just been made. We're not old hat about this. We do let you wear makeup, but uh, please use your own common sense about it. Bright blue eyeshadow and false eyelashes a yard long would look very out of place in a hospital ward. I think um, <clears throat> sensible moderation's the word. <laughs> oh, and nail varnish, no colored nail varnish, please. And of course, no claws. Oh, damn, it's taken me ages to grow those. Me too. <laughs> yes. Well, we don't want our patients leaving the hospital scratched to pieces. You know, could she have done her French pleat as well as that? I don't know herself. Oh, yeah, because I remember when she would tie her hair up, she wouldn't do it in a bun. She would do like the two braids across her head, like how you yeah. see like, those Hansel and Gretel um, yeah. books. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. But what and, did you, as you as a young man, what did you think of the sort of the sexism in, in it when you when you watched it? Were you were you taken aback or oh did you think things have changed? Because, um, you know, you say at one point we were quite feminist. The whole series was very feminist in that they don't put up with it and they're all young women striving for their careers. Um, so, yeah, what did you think? It blew my mind, honestly, because it just kind of... Um, well, just the series in general, I mean, like, uh, just everything about it. I mean, obviously, it's, you know, I hate to say it, it's dated now, but it still has a message that is so timeless and, you know, stands for something that is so strong, that's bigger than I think, you know, the nursing profession in general. And just seeing things like, you know, all these old fashioned views of like, you know, men can't be nurses, only women can. If a man wants to be a nurse, he's queer yeah, and yeah, you know yeah. the old-fashioned views of how nurses um before angels the um kind of hollywood image of nurses was that they were all dolled up and pretty and like you know they were just there to hold a hand by the bedside and mopping a fevered brown and just donning an apron and angels was just so groundbreaking in the fact that it showed that it was more than that and that it was about mm -hmm the hard work, the nitty gritty, dealing with patients who were gonna be temperamental, who were sick, who um, were going to- Die. Die, yes, exactly. And that it wasn't, you know, just all about, you know, it wasn't all glitz and glamor. And that was the goal actually, from what I understand in my research of um, Paula Mill and uh, Ron Craddock, I think it says the name, right? Craddock or Ron something Craddock, like that. Yeah. Ron. Ron Craddock, thank you. That was their goal with this series was to give the nursing profession as much of a realistic portrayal as yeah. it could in the same way that Z cars or Z cars did for the law enforcement profession. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yeah. Yeah, another another episode that I watched was Interim um, when she's waiting for exam results and the, the speech about, um, you know, I can't, um, I can't take death. I associate it with my own loneliness. 
I can't take death. I associate it with loneliness, with my own loneliness. I can't separate the two means of thought. No. Never could. I walk along a busy street, say, in the West End, and I see, I see a shape, a person, someone beautiful or interesting, moving or standing still. And I think, don't die. It's like, like a plea, I suppose. Or a protest. Yes. You think death is unjust? Well, yes, I suppose I do. I think that life can also be unjust. For some. <laughs> For some, yes. I suppose I could always change the plea, say, don't live instead. Save us all a lot of trouble. Also, I can't talk to people. I have difficulty. You're talking to me. I haven't mixed enough. I have my dear father to thank for that. He wanted to protect me from the rank and file. So all in all, even with a clean desk and a flair for getting on duty promptly, I haven't a lot to offer this profession. Oh, how can you tell? Oh, I don't think it's a matter of telling. I think it's a matter of feeling. I'd like to be like most of the others and take terminal care in my stride. See it through to its conclusion, go off, have a meal, see a show. There's a man dying on my ward, and I can't take it. You've had terminal cases like that on your ward before. I know. Is this one so different? In a way. I've listened to him. He's done things. He's had friends, had pride, his dignity. He's travelled. He's enjoyed life, what there was of it. And you haven't. Well, I suppose I should be getting back. As someone who's supposed to have difficulty in expressing themselves, you're not doing badly. I just gathered momentum, that's all. Unfortunately, it won't last. Shirley, this man on your ward... Yes? Doesn't the fact that you care mean something? It means something to me, yes. Well, what about him? No, Miss Windrop. I mean, let's face it, in his state, I'm about as important to him as the paint on the walls. And that, it was written by P.J. Hammond, a wonderful, wonderful script, um, for which I got glowing review from Clive James, who was then, you know, the ma major television, um, saying that Shirley Brent was, I can think I can remember, was the most riveting character on the small screen and there's no reason why the show shouldn't run forever. And I thought, oh, wow, fantastic. I'll never be out of work. Well, it's not like that. It's not like that. <laughs> but it was nice that he noticed because um, that was that was quite an episode, that one. I That was such a good episode, but it just, it breaks my heart watching that episode a bit because your character took so much heat from the other nurses, you know, particularly. Oh, I've forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. I just, they were like, you know, with like, you know, um, Leslie Dunlop's character, Ruth, be saying to Shirley, you know, Shirley, there's just some times where I can't stand you. I was simply giving instructions. Well, those were orders. Instructions. Well, maybe it's just the tone of your voice. Well, I don't see what that has to do with it. Oh, but then it's the same old problem, isn't it? Problem? Yeah, with background. You middle-class bitches, it's inbred. You think you're talking to part-time servants? Ruth. Look, I mean, that girl is on her first ward in her first year. She simply had to be put in her place, that's all. Oh, put in her place? Well, she was... She was rude. Rude? Crafty. She tries it on. Look, that girl happens to be intelligent. And she's also living in the kind of age where people have the right to answer back when they know they're in the right. Now, that's rudeness, is it? You know, Shelley, there's times when I just cannot stand you. This is 1975, sweetheart. Your dear old daddy may not know it or couldn't tell you, but people are beginning to think for themselves. All right. I'll apologise to the girl if you think that will... Oh, that wouldn't help. You couldn't even apologise him without looking larger than life or being twice as overbearing. 
Ruth. Ruth, I'm not good at having rows with people. It can upset me for days. So what do you expect me to do about it? I'm simply trying to put things right. So, well, I, I'm trying to tell you that it's a waste of time. You just don't go about things in the right way. Look, you shouldn't live alone for a start. That is no way to learn about relationships. I like living alone. Are you sure? I wouldn't do it otherwise, would I? I don't know. You're so damned sensitive. But you've been cocooned. You should have joined the workers long ago. It's yeah. like, oh my goodness, poor Shirley. You know, I think if yeah. people watch the episode, uh, the episode Legacies later on, they will understand Shirley more. And that is something I will come to later um, about yeah. how she's old fashioned in her ways. But, you know, she means well and that, you know, she, you know, she's misunderstood. Yeah. 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 She's she's very serious. Um, about her work. I suppose I share that with her a bit. Um, although I've done a lot of stand-up now, later in my career, which I love. But um, <laughs> stand-up's a serious business. Mm. And in terms of accuracy, did you and the cast have enough resources at hand for unfamiliar medical procedures? And yes. Yes. Um, like, what exactly did you have? Like, were you a um... wonderful lady called Saga Tyndale, who was a registered nurse, um, and also some other. She's got another. Um, she's got other letters after her name, but she was on stage, as far as I remember, um, whenever we went uh, with us, whenever we needed it. I suppose she would be there through rehearsal, so that all, every procedure would be have to get past, go past her. I mean, even hanging up the back, you know, the, hanging up the drips, um, change, turning somebody over, changing anything, bedpan. Um, I can still say sphygmomanometer, which is how you used to take blood pressure, which was with the stethoscope and you listened and then you had to time it, which is why the nurses had their watches there to turn, turn up. Um, I could never, I ne never really knew what I was doing, but I could still say, I could say sphygmomanometer. You go up and then come back down again. But S Saga was wonderful. She was um, marvelous. So yes, there was always, uh, you were never, uh, never flying blind on procedure. You know, and of course, you know, there was some, you know, inac of course, there were some mistakes and inaccuracies here and there. But overall, it was very accurate, you know, because I've shown the uh, episodes to a few of my friends who are in the medical profession. Oh, have you? And they have said, you know, oh, that's so outdated. But that does look like something that they would have done back then. You know, I mean, today you don't have to shake down the thermometer. No, no. And you put it, you put your finger in you know, in, into a little thing to measure your pulse and your oxygenation. Yep. Mm -hmm. We've all got those now because of COVID. Oh, yes. <laughs> Gosh. Imagine how different angels would have been if they had been portraying them in a time of a pandemic like this. Oh. We've been so lucky, um, well, my generation, to have gone so long without something like this happening. I mean, you guys have got it much, much earlier in your lives. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a weird one. Tell me how, how did you discover angels? Oh, uh, it's very interesting. I discovered angels actually through Fiona Fullerton and, um, Julie Don Cole's filmography. I had grown up watching, uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory uh -huh. with Julie. That is one of my favorite movies of all time. Anyone who knows, knows how much, how many times I watched it on VHS and DVD. And I'd known Fiona when I got a little bit older and I watched the film Nicholas and Alexandra where she played uh, Anastasia. Yeah. And um, I saw many of her other films over the years like uh, the Alice in Wonderland and James Bond. And I was looking through both of their filmographies. I don't think it was at the same time, but I noticed there was some sort of credit for, the tel for a television show called Angels. And I was like, hmm, what's that? That looks interesting. And I discovered this probably in like 2010, 2011, maybe. And then I was like, oh, these two ladies who I've grown up watching so many times over the years since childhood were in a television show together. I've got to see that. And of course, at the time, it wasn't on DVD. 
And I didn't know much about the British film industry at that time. I knew, like I had my favorite actresses and actors like Peter Sellers, I watched all the time. Lynn Frederick is my ah, favorite. So that's, what, that's why Lynn, the Lynn, but you started with Peter Sellers and then found Lynn. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I didn't find Lynn through Peter Sellers. I found it through Fiona Fullerton, actually, funny. Oh, because wow. she was in the film Nicholas and Alexandra with Fiona Fullerton. They played sisters in that film. Oh, she was, uh, I didn't know that. Didn't yep. know that. She was one of the other princesses, one of the other sisters. Uh, yep. As time went on, as I got into more college, I discovered more tele British television series. And then, of course, Angels. I came across on DVD and I was like, gotta get this you know and I immediately bought you know the two discs the box set without even thinking <laughs> and I just you know watched the show I learned more about British actors and all the other guest stars and the importance of it and what, what kind of segue it filled out for the history of feminism and you know women's rights and you know portraying strong women and the rest is history. My goal with doing this interview series is to create a case study for Angels and the television show to make sure it's on record in history to show how much impact and how much of, you know, a phenomenon it was during yep. its heyday of, you know, spreading, of being such a big rite of passage for feminism and women's rights and female empowerment and yep. encouraging Hollywood to you know, be more authentic in their um, portrayals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was an episode called Case Study. So that's, um, <laughs> you can use that. Yes. Um, so for the first few episodes, I think Shirley was not seen in the best, in the best light. And I think at first she was portrayed as like this stern, bossy and thorough person who took her work maybe a bit too seriously. She put her foot in it this time. Ooh. Joe, mocked up all the tests for yesterday. You'll have to stay an extra day now. Bet you won't thank her for that. Why did you have to drop her in it? It was her own fault. She should have done what she was told. Haven't you ever made a mistake, honey? It was a noisy, badly behaved little thing. A kid like that can cause an awful lot of upset on a ward. And there were some pretty ill patients. Oh, it was only a very temporary inconvenience. The whole visit didn't last more than five minutes. I gather Mr. Smethers packed up considerably after seeing his grandson. And none of the other patients raised the slightest objection. I couldn't be sure of that. I had the welfare of the ward as a whole to consider. And in Sister Easby's absence, it was my responsibility. Mm, responsibility is a big word has many implications. You did what you felt was best for the ward as a whole. Perhaps in doing so, you lost sight of what was in the best interest of your patients as individuals. And what if the two conflict? Well, they often do. That's when you're most called upon to use your judgment. That doesn't always mean going strictly by the book. Ignore the rules? Well, perhaps I'm overstating it. Authority, both with your patients and with your colleagues, must be used wisely with a sense of humanity. All the qualifications in the world are of no use to a nurse if she's lacking in compassion. And I suppose you're saying Nurse Longhurst isn't because she let them in. Nurse Longhurst's behavior is for me to deal with. Of course, she acted wrongly. She was dealing with her patients, not as objects, but as human beings. And that's tremendously important. Do you understand that, Nurse? But later on, we learned more of her backstory as someone who was raised by older parents with old fashioned values and perhaps grew up with a more mature mindset than most people her age. This Thursday is our 25th anniversary as a teaching hospital. And I've been asked to present one of the bouquets. Oh, that's nice. It's quite an occasion. All the parents come and the mayor. Yeah. Well, not everyone gets asked to present a bouquet. I'm sure. She's managed to sell her house, though I don't think it's very honest, repapering over the dam. There's a do at the hospital on Thursday. Thursday at three. And I've been asked to present one of the bouquets. Go on. We did the best we could.
And I think we got a better understanding of where her personality traits and everything came from. I mean, do you find that accurate? Yeah, um, I do, especially having had a little revisit today because she's quite forthcoming. And um, she went, when we learned that she failed, she actually had failed her finals the year before. So that explains what, you know, why she's very, very keen to pass them this time and taking it very seriously. You belong in a different time. Thanks. Well, you do. Even if you pass this course, you'll just be a new recruit for an old school. Perhaps I won't pass. No, perhaps you won't. And and that she she feels that she's been overprotected by her parents. You know, my dear daddy saw to that. I, it's amazing how the lines come back when you're watching. It's really weird. Um, but yeah, so she she grows, learns to relax a bit with people and trust people a bit more, I think. And um, yeah. So yes, I think um, the develop her development, I hope, I thought that they did a good job from their end and I hope I did a reasonable job from my end. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. You That's definitely played it. Yeah. You, you sold it very well. She grows in confidence when she's doing the old people and she grows when she's doing the psychiatric people because, you know, she's, um, she finds she's able to, uh, to do that. Yep. And, you know, I think just given the fact that she was raised by older parents, I think that probably had a lot of inspiration for her for wanting to do specialize in geriatrics. Yes. And also, she says, I remember, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not pretty and I'm not going to go off and have hundreds of grandchildren. I'm not the daughter they wanted. They wanted, you know, somebody pretty and social like Joe. They wanted somebody like Joe. Um, and so I've got to be good at my career because that's the only thing that's left to her. I should have passed, though. Yes. Telling my parents was the worst bit. I'm not the sort of daughter that I've chosen anyway. They'd have liked someone pretty and gay. You'd marry well and produce lots of grandchildren. Seeing I wasn't that, I had to be a success in my career. I still think you will be. And there were many occasions in the series where your character was subject to so very harsh words, like we said, from uh, Leslie Dunlop's character, Ruth, and, uh, you know, occasionally from Joe, which is Julie's character. Now, I frequently hear Nuss Brent shivering you along to ensure that the work gets done. That shouldn't be necessary. It isn't necessary. And what do you mean? I don't need Shirley to tell me what to do. She knows that. Nagging me just makes her feel important. But from everything that I've learned thus far, it seems that you guys all got along. We all got on very well, actually. We, we were fairly riotous. I mean, we did get into trouble a few times. I think when we invaded various BBC bars after um, filming and things. Um, <laughs> We we got we all got we all we had a ball. We had an absolute ball. I mean, it was an amazing time to be in the heart of British television, which if you rehearsed at what we used to call the Acton Hilton, which was a, a building in North, North London, which was five floors of rehearsal studios. And you would go in and the, the lift you would the lift doors would open and, and there would be you know, Morecambe and Wise, Peter O'Toole, Paul Schofield, and maybe two other incredibly famous people who you would squeeze yourself in with and go, oh, hello, 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 and go up to the to the fourth floor to start your rehearsal. Um, and there was a restaurant on the top floor where you all went for lunch, and there would be, you know, the cream of... Of, of British television light, in light entertainment and drama and, and, th and you know, the theatre stars who were coming in to do television. It was extraordinary time. That, it's been, it's gone. I went past the other day and it, they turned it into a costume store and now it's been knocked down or rebuilt as apartments. And it was awful because <laughs> so many, so many memories came flooding back. But um, yeah, that, li that lift was, the doors would open and there would be people you never dreamt you'd 
be in a working situation with. Fantastic. So lucky. We took it all completely for granted. Of course you do. You know, you're 24 years old, take completely for granted. Next part. Um, I wanted to, um, I would like to take a moment to ask if you could share some memories of some of your uh, co-stars who are no longer with us and anything like memories, flashbacks, sound bites, anything. And I've got a list here and I'll read some names off to you. Um, I think it's very important first that we start off with your mother, Nancy Gower. Uh, well, yes, who died last year. Mm -hmm. So I'm still processing that very much. She was 97. Wow. Um, and she died last June. So it's not even a year. And there's a photograph of her over there. Um, yeah. So, yeah. How did she get into playing your mother on that show? Like, do you oh, remember what the process her. was? Yeah, I, I said, my mother's an actress. Why don't you get her in to play my mother? And they did. <laughs> <laughs> was it intimidating at all having your mother there? Like, you know, yes, since she's I think so I, yes, it was. <laughs> It, it, well, I mean, we got on, we got on very well. We had a very good relationship. Um, it was slightly, it was slightly like having your parents at a first night, you know, <laughs> which way is this going? But uh, she loved acting. Um, so she was very, very happy. Um, and then I think she, they replaced her with uh, the wonderful- Peggy Ann Ward. Peggy Ann Ward. Yeah, yeah. Well, since we uh, started, we'll bring her up next. Peggy Ann Ward. What yep. do you remember about her? Just, she was such a wonderful actress. Peggy Ann Wood. Yeah, yeah. A lot of uh, act, a lot of people, though, act, particularly the actresses, lasted into their nineties. Uh, you know, people who were played the geriatrics or you know were in earlier episodes. So, yeah. So she was. She was very good. Very good. Well, you could tell she's very good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what about Lloyd Lambo, who uh, played your father in that episode too? Yes, and I think he played it. I think he did two episodes. I think. I think he's in another episode um, as my dad, because I remember filming another episode, and it was supposed to be winter, and there was a snowstorm, and we were right up against seven o'clock when they either had to go into overtime, you know, and scene with Lloyd and the snow started to come down inside the house and I kept going I didn't laugh I kept going saved them a fortune <laughs> I, he was great I mean again um and also another person uh, who's no longer with us um Faith Brooke who played uh, Miss Heather Windrup what yeah. was she like Faith I became very good friends with Faith um She's a magnificent person, wonderful person, wonderful act actress. Um, and I saw quite a lot of her outside the studio and um, she taught me how to make very good omelets. So we'd often have, uh, have supper together. And then she moved, uh, we've had, we'd, we both had houses quite near each other um, in the eighties. Uh, and uh, I kept, she died in 2012, I think, didn't she? Yes. So we 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 kept in touch because my son went to the same school as her son had, and we were we'd both been single parents. You know, she'd been a single parent. I I became a single parent. Um, so we had a great deal in common, and I suppose my my only regret is that I didn't see more of her. Um, you know, in, in from I don't know twenty. Nine on with 2009 onwards or something you know we did she did she did a play very late on amazing one woman show at the german theater she was just fantastic i mean she was a complete she was a star she was a star yeah, yeah. Lovely, lovely 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 lady um another person um i have here uh susan field who had a guest spot role on one of the episodes as yep. a very cantankerous patient, uh, Mrs. Ennis, who was Mrs. suffering. Ennis, from... who accuses us all of stealing her bath bag. <laughs> yep, yes, and she... <laughs> What's going on, Mrs. Ennis? My toilet bag has been stolen. I'm sure it hasn't, Mrs. Ennis. I tell you definitely, it's been stolen, and it was a particularly good one. It was given to me by my niece for my birthday. Well, when did you last have it? 
yesterday when those two trainees came to give me a blanket bath and a pretty messy effort it was too. And I went to check this morning and it wasn't there. She's just been to the bathroom and there's no trace of it. Well, I'll have a look for it. I'm sure it'll turn up. Things have a way of finding their way back. But there's not good enough, there's been for she all about that? She thinks someone spinched a stupid old wash bag. <laughs> There now, Mrs. Ennis, there's no cause to fret. You probably got put in someone else's locker by mistake. I'll get one of my nurses to have another look round. When? As soon as someone's got a moment. We do have a great deal to do on the ward this morning. What was she like? Well, she, well, she, I mean, she's great. She's, uh, she wasn't Mrs. Ennis, you know, she was, she was completely different to Mrs. Ennis. But she played that sort of character very, very, very well indeed. Um, that was the only one she did. So I didn't, I didn't know her outside of um, Angels, because I mean, so many came in. You know, there there would be a couple of dozen new people every episode or whatever. So uh, not not every you couldn't make close friends with everybody. But she's, I mean, this you can tell from the way the scenes bounce. You know, we had great fun doing doing that. Now, Mrs. Ennis, I'm sure nobody has taken your... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. That was that was just like a star moment for me, a glowing moment for me, hearing you say that. <laughs> <laughs> the fan the fanboy in me is coming out. <laughs> oh, good, good. We must keep that. Yeah, keep that going. Yeah. Um, one last name I have for the uh, actors who are no longer with us. Uh, Deborah Makepeace, who played one of the minor roles of student nurse Gail. Yeah. Um, do you remember her? I do, and and she 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 died so shockingly young, um, awfully young. She did she did a lot. She was very she was very good. She was in one of the ones I watched today. She's very good, very good. But she was she wasn't uh, a regular, so she wasn't part of the the badly behaved group that we uh, uh, that we <laughs> formed. Um, but she was lovely. She was a lovely, lovely lady. Yeah, yeah. Did you have you followed her the, the her the other career? Yeah. Oh yes. I yeah. actually also have a petition circulating for her too for the BBC to release her two earlier projects that she did. Um, she did, in 1973, she did a television series adaptation of A Little Princess, which was originally played by Shirley Temple in 1939. Oh, and wow. the other one is The Chinese Puzzle, which was sort of like this mystery miniseries, children's show, um, not children's show, like aimed at children and preteens. And it was very thrilling. It was kind of like The Tyrant King. Do you remember? I think that's a good yeah. thing to too. So I'm petitioning right now for the BBC to release those two titles from their archives on DVD. Okay, great. Good. Good. Yes. Yes, she she should be. She should be. It's um yeah, too young, too young. Yeah, and she was only 42 and she died of cancer and I know. It brings it I was 42 when I had my son. You know. Um uh, who you know, lucky who's the luckiest girl in the world? Me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the show was known for covering many topics that were very, very controversial back then. And, you know, today these topics would be controversial, but they're talked about more now. And some of these topics were stuff like alcoholism, addiction, uh, anorexia, right, anorexia, eating disorders, hey, oh, hey. Gen yep. gender roles, yep. all sorts of types of things that had never really been covered yep. before. Yeah. Were were there any that um, stood out to you that were like shocking or you know hit you close to home or I think the, like, wow. no, the anorexia one was was quite um, interesting because we anorexia really wasn't talked about in the press or and, you know certainly nobody owned up to it. It wasn't the fashionable disease that it then became. Mm -hmm. I mean that in inverted commas. Um, yeah. I'm not belittling it. And so that was, um, yeah, eating disorder. I think that that made a great impression because um, it really, really wasn't wasn't talked about. So, in a, you know, again, it's another example of the program breaking new ground. Um, mental illness, that wasn't, there was nothing, there wasn't very much, did one ever hear about mental illness then in the 70s? No, but there, you know, there was Shirley striding around a, 
psychiatric department with lots of different um, mental conditions being explored. Yeah, yeah. I think it was at its best when it was, of course it was, when it was grappling with difficult, difficult subjects. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And watching it from a modern day perspective, it's like, wow, you know, even back then they were touching on it, but people yeah. weren't quite focusing on it or they didn't see the precariousness of it or the seriousness of it maybe at that time because today we have so much education we have knowledge support there's so much out there for these different issues and there certainly i don't think was anything like that back then for no. those issues and the only way to break down those barriers is to talk about it and have it on have it on television yep um, I'm, um you know, look at the strides that have been made with, with mental health lately. I think it's so important, especially for, for, for young men, um, that they're encouraged to, to, to talk about it when it's not, when things aren't all right, that it's not, you know, get rid of the stigma. Yeah. 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 And um, Angels was such a phenomenon when it came out and it spawned all sorts of merchandise, you know, dolls and play sets from Denny's Fisher, uh, these yearly books that were called annuals, tie-in novels, and various other things. Did you come across any of that stuff? And if so, what was it like seeing yourself on all that? I was always surprised that Shirley wasn't wasn't a model for, you know, an adult costuming. <laughs> you know, I thought, that, you know, if anybody had any real imagination, they would... <laughs> They would have done done a, done a version of Matron for the for the adult consumption adult oh. market. Uh, oh, so no, there was nothing fun like that. We and we had we had these books, uh, the annuals. Late on, they brought out a, one doll, but they were very careful not to say who it was based on, so that they didn't have to pay any royalties. There's a we. So, Mm, yes, merchandising now today. I mean, if that series was now happening, you know, the the agents would be all over those contracts as well. Of course, there wasn't any kind of contract for that then. So I think probably Lee said soon as men did. But I've got the annuals and I've got the books. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got, I got two annuals. Have you? Yeah. How many were there? Were oh, there more gosh. than two? Uh, I think. Um... They went as far as the, oh gosh. Uh, yeah, they did maybe four or five. Don't quote me on that, but four or five. I only have two because those are the ones that pertain to the episodes and the series that I've seen. Yeah, I think I've only got two. two. I think I've only got two. Yeah. That's yeah. the one where you were wearing that gold and pink dress. Oh, oh, oh yes. My wonderful hippie dress. Oh my God, why did I ever get rid of it? <laughs> I got rid of, I also have Bieber dresses as well. Does Bieber mean anything to you? Bieber was a oh. shop in the 70s in High Street, Kensington, and they would be worth a fortune if I'd kept them. But of course, you know, out they go at some point when you're having a clearance. Yeah, well, so annoying. If people here in America hear, the, hear Bieber, they think of yeah. Justin Bieber. Oh, yes. <laughs> B I B A, Americans. B I B A, Bieber. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> um, and during the height of the show's popularity, you know, people don't think, I don't think people understand how big the show was. It was such a national phenomenon. And how recognizable did you guys become? Like for you, like what experiences did you have with like, you know, meeting fans and maybe going out and being mobbed or something? Like what experiences did you have? Well, I always call it my heyday, you know, when I was asked to open Fates. <laughs> um, and I had a I had a white soft top MGB Roadster car. I lo always loved cars. I'm a bit mad about cars. And I bought this. I, I, I spent the whole, I think it was the whole, it was all the money I had. So it's probably the whole of the first series or something on this uh, MG car, this, this sports car. Um, so we opened, we were asked to open Fates. Um, we were asked to go to Holland to record a record with, um, uh, in, in a, in, and then to appear on the Nana Muscourish Christmas show in Hilton, Holland. Now, if you haven't heard Angels Sing Christmas Carols, I'll have to send you that tape as well. Oh. 
that I'd love to hear all four, all six of you sing together. I always put it, I think it was just four of us. I don't think it was all of us, but um, I always put it, I often put it out again just before Christmas in the hope that one day it'll make number one in the charts. <laughs> it'd have to be on iTunes. It was, it should be, it should be on iTunes. I'm, I don't know what it is. It was EMI. Um, I'm sure we could get it onto iTunes. I'm sure you can get it onto iTunes. Oh, but, I hope uh, so. <laughs> I'll send you an MP3. I, th I sing Shirley's. I sing I'm Dreaming White Christmas, and I get that top note too. I was far more excited by the fact that Stefan Grappelli and Yehudi Menuhin re were recording in the in the studio next door in Hilversum. So I said, when they said who wants to go first, I said I'll go first. Let me let me do my bit first, and then I snuck out and and went into the the sound booth and watched Yehudi Menuhin and Stefan Grappelli, who shares my birthday, shared my birthday recording tea for two and it was wow. just magic so you know it's wonderful what um it's uh, it's wonderful what 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 perks come up what extraordinary things happen when you're just doing your job really but uh how would you feel if since the show was so popular during its time how would you feel if they rebooted the show with a whole new set of characters in the same setting of St. Angela's Hospital, but had some of the original characters in the mix too. How would you feel about that? So would they, you mean, would it, they would set it now in hospitals now? Yes. Um, and with the same, with the same um, intention. Yes. Find the show of being realistic, not, you know, not casualty and not emergency yeah i yep. think it'd be great and i think given the pandemic they're really uh there's you know there's there's room for something that um shows nurse young nurses in the throes of what is a very very difficult thing yeah no i'm all for i'm all for uh, reboots particularly as as angels has sort of not sunk without trace but is not you know it's not um it's got its it's got its following. It's not like a period piece of obscurity, but it does have its following and it's growing. People yeah. are starting to realize it more. Good, good, good. Yeah, at <laughs> least I hope that's my goal with this. That's one of the things I hope to do with this. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and one last question. Um, when you look back on your career and your life, um, what does angels mean to you? I mean, I'm pretty sure there's. I, compared to something like Doctor Who and that legacy goes on and on and on. But um, what does Angels mean to you? Um, it means an awful lot because it was such a, um, a cornerstone of not only exposure, uh, but also of training. You know, how many young actresses get three years, three, you know, three years solid of camera technique training and camera work training and and all that so that you know it was second nature by the time we'd, we'd finished I mean that's that's as far it's the longest run I've done um though I did quite a few episodes of Emma Dale and you know they've done quite a few episodes of other things oh something in disguise that was a, another one but um to be a regular in a in, in in 50 minute episodes um, and to have to to have every third or fourth script to you know you it would be your story um, was was massive in terms of developing one's craft really uh, so I look I look back on it with with intense gratitude and affection um, and I, you know, I've done, I've made, I've did a film in New Zealand. I've traveled around the world. I've done all sorts of other wonderful, wonderful uh, things, part, you know, parts and worked with wonderful people. Uh, but I suppose just because it was so concentrated and for so long, one made great, very strong friendships, and uh, it was very important. Yeah, it was. It was important, and it it gave me love, my love for film work. You know. 
and cameras and I, I, I became a professional photographer for, for many years after that and it was all to do it's all to do with that wonderful getting in there with the camera lovely stuff lovely yeah so I mean it it was it was a talk about a lucky break it was a lucky break for especially, all. especially since it, it was your first role yeah yeah no agent unheard of 